I had a I had a hugely great support group, and I'll tell you why it worked. It was a group of women who, who were all in a you know, graduate research group on gender men at Princeton, and we were all in different fields. None of us knew very much about each other's topics, you know. Although some of us did, some were in French literature, I was in French history, and different things. But we didn't talk about the content very much. We talked about process. So we had coffee once a week, and the only requirement was to say what you have, you know, what you've done that week. It was kind of checking in with each other. And I actually think you can use almost anyone for that process. Sometimes it's your mother or it's a sibling. You, know, you need somebody who's just punctuating. Or, you know, I used a karate class. I had this karate class that I took. Just, and, you know, it's like, by the next time I come to class, I want to have done this. So you need benchmarking and goal posting, I guess, would be a way to put it. And I thought that was more important, talking about the process, than will you read my outline or the content. Because at the end of the day, you're going to write it. And you've got lots of, you've got your advisor to read it, you've got your peer group in terms of your graduate program. Those are the people you talk content with. But I also thought having a group that was not about content, that was just helping you to benchmark, because it's lonely. And it's the part of graduate school that there isn't structure for. Mm -hmm. So benchmarking, that kind of support, to me, was really, really crucial. And they're cheerleading for you, you know, and that, 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 that kind of work. But you when I wrote the disc, I had a writing buddy, and we both had jobs. And we had said we were going to finish our disses, and so we were going to finish our disses. So we would work all day, and then we would meet late in the evening and walk to downtown Ann Arbor and have a beer. And then we'd come back and then we'd work all day. You know, so it, that's a certain kind of an experience, right? It's a different kind of experience. but. Um, with other publications, I have been members of like, you know, reading groups and where someone in the group presents their work and you get feedback. And that's actually a really important process. Mm -hmm. when, you, when, you're, when you're ready to share a chapter, um, you know, with people that can be good readers in different ways because they know the field and they're just really good critical thinkers, that kind of feedback process helps you then to go back and edit. You know, or if people say, I don't really get this, what are you talking about? Or, or this sounds like too dense, you know, or, or it's not really great writing yet. You know, the, the feedback is really, really good because then you know you have to go back and rework it. And so that, this allows me to just add one important thing, which is you can write a draft in one day, for example, of something. Um, it's possible because I, I've done it, as I said, but that doesn't mean that you don't need a lot of editing and feedback. So you have to give yourself a lot of space. And in that being able to go back in a calm way to read what you've written with distance, those rewrites and throwing out of, of parts of it, mm -hmm. to be able to let it go, save it for later maybe, you know, make a duplicate copy if you really think you wrote something beautifully, but it's not working. But that ability to throw things away, I think, is really crucial to allowing yourself to think better and to think more clearly. So criticism was actually a really great, great thing for me. People not getting my project at all really allowed me to think of, wow, well then how do I build a bridge for people to understand what I'm saying? And that uh, allowed me to really think about who do I want to reach and, and what kind of translating or bridge building is important for me to make to people who aren't immersed as I am or specialists in the things that I am. I'm really happy to, you know, I'm really happy for the criticisms and misunderstandings. If you have a completed draft, then I think it should go to your committee members to give you detailed as early as possible, you know, and then you sit with it calmly and you try to address their questions and concerns. So if you have a completed draft and you feel like that you've actually finished the researching and you've actually finished the bibliographic you know, if, I don't know what kind of research you did, but, you know, if you're doing bulk bibliography kind of research or field research, if you've done all of that and it's now a question of the writing and the crafting and trying to figure out if you have enough, you know, if you've cited enough people or, you know, if it's a question of that, 
is it, is it more style or is it a question of you know the intellectual? You're not sure if it's as coherent and powerful as you want it to be. Well, That's, yeah. Yeah, I think maybe the, some things that you said resonate um, in terms of organization, finding an organizational structure, mm -hmm. and then when you were talking about the altar, I think I read that to mm -hmm. mean that you're looking at. Um, the grammar of how certain topics fit together. So what the, for instance, you were saying that you study the relationship between art and politics. Right. Like how do you, instead of simply having those objects, art and politics, how do you make the, mm -hmm. the connections between those things more clear? Mm -hmm. I usually like you uh, write, I think of chunks rather than chapters to begin with. You know, I write in chunks and I start lumping things. I mean, you, you do that the file folders, mm -hmm. there are lots of pages. You know, I lump it and then, and then, I think one of the hardest things to do is to get distance on your own writing. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes mm -hmm. exercises that I do are to imagine that it's, imagine the book you want to pull off the bookshelf in a bookstore and say, that's a book I really loved. You know, so that you sort of, and out, Doing, out, doing outlines in the absence of your manuscript. Go to a cafe or go, you know, get away from your manuscript and out of your head. I can already hear you formulating the argument right here when you were just trying to explain what the problem was. You've already given us a thesis statement, right? And um, getting away, getting the, taking distance is really important. And I think outlining, I find, both at the macro level of the whole thing trying out different chapter orders. And, and the only one is just, I say, okay, what, I, I have a conversation, okay, what am I trying to say here? So that's another way. And then, why do I think that? Yeah. Well, you must have evidence there that you can see that made you think this. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of writing and even mm -hmm. just intellectual activity analysis is actually quite intuitive. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you come to, to and, and, and part of the challenge is articulating those intuitions. Mm -hmm. It's like getting something from your subconscious into your conscious mm -hmm. uh, realm, which is that you, you, when you're reading and absorbing and cogitating at night, you notice know sleep studies. And all mm -hmm. so you're doing a lot of analytic work, mm -hmm. but getting that visible to yourself is is there are lots of mechanisms. I, outlining is one I use. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. actually, even sometimes. Around, having an out loud conversation with myself, okay, Carla, what are you trying to say here? Mm -hmm. Why do you believe what you believe? Mm -hmm. Once I know what I'm trying to say, like, mm -hmm. you just said the next question is, why do I think that? Mm -hmm. And then you say, oh yeah, well, because of that quote, and that quote, and that quote, and that piece of evidence, mm -hmm. those, are the, those are the ones you want to feature. Mm -hmm. Those are going to be your selections. Mm -hmm. So I like outlining, you know, as an exercise because it's, you can, and doing it, because you just get absorbed in the forest of it. You know, it's too big to think all at once from the inside. You have to sort of you know, get away sometimes just to take a walk. But if you can scribble and do an outline, and you re-outline and re -outline. And that's how I got through that getting stuck period, which is I kept outlining it. And what am I trying to stay here? And the reason it was hard was because it was so complex. It was actually a very dense argument. And I had to, I just had to unpack it further. It was like more unpacking. I thought, it, you know, somehow it was too compressed because it was such a complicated argument. Yes. So that I had to just, I had to actually give it more ventilation, give my own thinking more ventilation. And I think sometimes we don't, I often say that to the students too, sometimes, you know, let it get complicated. You know, you so want it to come together that you're kind of putting too much pressure on it. You know, you're asphyxiating yourself. I actually think that's, you know, because the anxiety, and I think it's just, this is all about anxiety now in some ways. It's asphyxiating. You just, you know, let it get complicated. Let it get complicated, and then maybe you write five more pages, and then you realize that three of those pages that you thought you couldn't move without, you can just cut. Like, okay, that large, the other thing I will say is usually the first five pages I write, I throw away. Like, I introduce a chapter three times before I really introduce the chapter. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of getting going, mm -hmm. getting going, getting going. It's like a warm-up exercise, you know. And I warm up and I say, okay, well, maybe I can do it on one foot. Oh, maybe I can do it on two foot. And then, you know, I just wiped out the first five. You know, I choose the introduction I preferred out of the three I'd just written. Mm -hmm. And then you're really going. Mm -hmm. So you kind of, so 
like warming up for a musical concert or something. I'd like to add something. I really appreciate your question, and I also really appreciate your response, Carla, because I think that, that when, you're, when you do finally really enter the work, you know, the research, right? Maybe you're taking notes, maybe you're just really in it, and it becomes something other than what you thought, or it becomes something because you just started with research questions or an attraction to a set of objects or a site to study. Something happens which is knowledge. And it's also, you know, as Carla was saying, um, it's, it's sometimes that's a knowledge that is still very inarticulate. So it's, it is part of the realm of the intuition. Something that, you know, a lot of our knowings accumulate and, and push us towards, you know, research this, look at this, read this book, do this, even though you don't yet know how to articulate the connection. And so that's, that is a difficulty that we should expect. That is the creative process. That's always in any field of making, including thinking, the creative process. And so then exactly what you did is the right thing to do. It's to say, okay, what's missing are connections. How do I make chapter one and chapter two cohere? How do I make chapter six and chapter one cohere? You know, provided one's not the introduction, right? And so, in fact, whether you write your outlines like, you know, bullets, etc., which is fine, or whether you make, like what I do is I make charts, like visual charts with constellations, you know, and I make connections that way. Um, however you do it, right, it could be just writing down the really key themes that are appearing in a chapter. And then you're like, okay, and so I've already done work about um, formulating what's happening here, but I haven't here. And often it is the, it is the case that the really difficult and scary but incredibly exciting stuff is what no one else has put into writing. Therefore, you can't cite somebody. You can't quote somebody. That's the moment of theorization. That's the moment of your own voice doing what you're supposed to be doing in a book and the disc is of originality. And so if you know that, you can kind of hold yourself through the process and say, I'm just finding language. And then you let yourself, I always tell my students very inelegantly, just spit it out. Spit it out, and sometimes what comes out is a giant hairball. It's so dense, and it's so rich, and you're convinced that it's so brilliant that if you tamper with it, you'll destroy it. But in fact, it needs to be unpacked. It needs to be, you know, so I had to get past that fear. Oh my God, is it something so complex and interesting? And I thought I would destroy it. It happens over and over. It's, it isn't the case. You get to look at what has come together because there is a logical explanation for how these things attract. So it's constantly asking yourself, how does chapter two relate? How am I going to segue it? And you begin very simply, not necessarily in an elegant way. And then you return, and you can make it as elegant as you want later. It's pretty. But the, the bottom line is just be truthful. What do you think? If you're just explaining to somebody who's not a scholar, how does this chapter connect with them? And then you give yourself enough time to go back many times to continue elaborating the connections. Then later, you'll go back and also make sure your introduction to every chapter and to the book include these types of you know, webs, right? these walkthroughs, knowing that you could narrate it in many ways, many, many ways. You could organize it in many ways. So you're choosing one. You're making a choice.